Hi there. What I'm doing today is I'm just going to go through the penetrating effects of some of the most common weapons that were found on a late 14th century battlefield. This weapon is called a pole axe. Not called a pole axe because it's an axe on a pole, because it's the head. The pole itself actually refers to the head itself. This is a multi-purpose weapon. It has a cutting edge, a penetrating point, and a good hard percussive surface for hammering and denting armour. As I said, today I'm mainly going to be looking at the actual point itself, the penetrating effect. So, the way that you actually get through steel, or any other form of armour, is to put as much pressure on as small an area as possible. This is the force over area principle. And I'm going to demonstrate this now using this and using two other forms of common weapons at the time, both of them pole arms, and I'm going to be hitting a piece of 1.6mm steel. This is more or less at the height you would expect to find somebody's chest. It hasn't been marked before, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually hit as hard as I can. Now, as I said, I'm trying to put pressure on this. Now, to simulate this, my arms are slightly heavier than they would be otherwise because I'm wearing a good pair of steel gauntlets. I'm also wearing a 50 pound weight jacket to simulate wearing torso armor. This is important because the kinetic energy I'm going to be generating is dependent upon the mass that I accelerate forwards. Let's see what happens. The hit that was generated here can actually be seen quite easily. I wasn't pushing particularly hard, but it managed to go right through this, not as though it wasn't there, but it certainly caused a lot of impact. It penetrated quite easily. If that straw bale, which is slightly compressive, just like a human, and also simulating armor, padded armor underneath the plate, this would have certainly caused a problem to whoever actually I jabbed it into. Another feature of this attack is the deformation of the armour itself. Pushing the armour back dinting it in. Armour has to be made so that it can easily slide over other pieces of armour or at least interlock with it. What you're doing is changing the fit of the armour slightly. However, if this was somebody's chest, considering that that amount had actually just gone into the chest, it's highly unlikely they're going to be worried too much about their armour as fit. Now, on to the next weapon. The second weapon I'm going to demonstrate is this. Occasionally known as the bill, occasionally known as a bill hook because of the hook here, which comes from an ag agricultural implement, or the halberd. Now this weapon is, it well, looks as though it's primarily designed for cutting, but the penetrating effects are enhanced here by having this cockspur at the back, and also here with a long point at the top. It should be noted that this point is actually diamond shaped in cross section. That is to actually provide a supportive back to the actual point itself, ensuring that there is very, very little flexibility in the actual penetrating hit. As it gets further in, not that we can expect it to get too far in, it will actually start to slow down because of this very wide blade here at the top, causing friction with the edge of any potential any potential armour and having to cut through. So we don't expect this thing to go in too far, but we'll see. Well, that worked. <clears throat> the profile of the hit can be seen here. Keeping, again, with that diamond cross-section, it doesn't go too far in, despite the fact that I've actually put quite a bit of effort into there. However, again, 
it has gone in an appreciable distance. Enough to certainly make anybody who was wearing padded armour uncomfortable. And at the same time, it has also potentially penetrated their flesh behind it. And don't forget, we still have the deformation of the actual armour itself. All of this armour is being stretched by these attacks. What that does is it actually increases the tensile stress on the actual armour itself. It gets thinner. Simple as that. The third weapon that we're going to be demonstrating is called a Streithammer. This one is modelled from a German Streithammer of the 15th and 16th centuries. Again, it possesses the top spike, but in this case it also possesses two spikes on either side. These are designed to give good penetrating attacks when used in an arc, creating as much kinetic energy as possible, plus of course it's not to be forgotten that my not inconsiderable mass is going to be moving forwards as well. We're going to do that in just a moment, but first we're going to concentrate on the penetrating effect of this top spike here. Now this spike isn't actually as sharp as the others, as can be seen. However, the actual penetrating attacks on the armour itself and the deformation attack can actually be seen. The kinetic energy that's going to be imparted into a, an opponent who could be moving forwards is certainly going to be appreciable. And if that deformation actually occurs on their armour, there is going to be a shockwave behind it. It is going to damage them. It's that simple. Now the plan is to use another piece of 1.5mm steel in order to test the overhead penetration of each one of these weapons. Now we're going to do this in a slightly different order. With this one, I have a feeling that it is actually going to be probably the best, but it's also going to be one of the thinnest ones. This one I think will be incredibly destructive, and this one, because the overhead penetration is probably going to be done with this, I think it's probably going to be even more destructive. It's going to be interesting to see how this works. Now this is loose on top of this straw. The reason for that is any helmet is going to have padding underneath it. That padding will compress under an attack. This is to decelerate an attack. Having an attack stop dead by your body still imparts that kinetic energy. The idea is to decelerate and absorb kinetic energy as it's imparted on your body. So this is a rough and ready simulation of how that can work. <coughs> as I said, the first hit was quite destructive. It is not what one would actually call a non-invasive hit. This almost certainly Travelled through should this have been part of the helmet, but almost certainly have travelled through to the skull. One of the reasons why this is such a destructive kind of hit is the arc itself. As the weapon transcribes an arc, this hook here, the bill hook or the bec de corban, the raven's beak, is actually travelling in the same direction as the arc. So the cutting edge and the point actually hit more or less dead on. Give it another hit. Again it can be seen just how destructive this kind of weapon is against this kind of arm. Once again fit that through. That is certainly going to make it through to the skull on a 15th century helmet. No two ways about it. It is going to get through. Just to actually labour the point somewhat, to avoid being injured, you are going to have to be 
at least that far away from your helmet when this hits. That's assuming that the actual blunt force trauma itself and the percussion effect doesn't harm you as well. Because if you're hit on top of the head, it's also going to cause a lot of kinetic energy to be translated all the way right through the top of your head, back down into your spine. Now the second weapon you'll see is the strike hammer. This is because I think it's actually going to be much more destructive to the plate itself than the previous weapon. I don't think it will penetrate quite as far. However, what is going to happen is because of the actual weight and the moment arm at the end of this weapon, you can see it carries much more metal than the actual uh, halberd itself and it's more concentrated towards the end, thus giving it a greater moment arm the further it is out. The point of balance of this weapon is actually just forward of where my hand would normally sit. This means that it does deliver a very, very heavy blow. Remember, half mv squared, half the mass, this mass coming right down on top of the hip. This doesn't have the characteristic curve of the Bec de Corbin. However, it does have behind it these two plate hammerheads themselves. These themselves will actually impart quite a lot of kinetic energy. It'll be interesting to see how this actually survives this. You'll note I've actually turned the plate around. That is because I hope to see if I can actually straighten it out a bit. Works. Well, this is what experimentation is for, isn't it? That penetrated quite easily into, or nearly, in fact, if not further, than the Bec de Corbin on the halberd. It shows that this weapon is incredibly destructive when used overhead. In a formation, if the front rank is using these weapons levelled, like so, the rear rank could quite easily be aiming these overhead to bring them down onto an opponent. It can also, if one takes this as being more or less the height of somebody on a horse, gives a beautiful hit straight overhead. An incredibly destructive weapon. Now finally, we're going to move on to the classic pole axe. Very, very popular weapon. You can even still see derivations of these being carried by people such as the Papal Guard in the Vatican, and also you will see them hanging around on the Yeoman of the Guard at the Tower of London. This percussive head has a much larger surface area, and going by the formula pressure equals force over area, that shows it is actually probably going to be less penetrative than the other weapons. However, the deformation with this may be similar. It depends on just how much effort we can actually bring in. Now bearing in mind again, I happen to be wearing steel gauntlets and that 50 pound weight vest. I'm also translating everything through using my chest muscles, arm muscles, and my leg muscles. Everything happens in this here. So let's see what happens. And finally, let's try it with a hand reversed. As you can see, the 1.5mm steel, even from there, has been deformed quite greatly. This has actually moved it out of the plane it was originally in, and certainly compressed it to well within where somebody's skull would be. This is the kind of injury that would lead, certainly, probably to cranial crushing, almost certainly to brain injury, hydrostatic shock within the brain itself, and also certainly skull fracture. So the penetrating hits can be seen to have come from both the Streithammer on the left and the Halberd. Both penetrated plate steel quite easily with very, very little effort on my part. 
Both of them also carry this beautiful thrusting spike at the end, which also this carries as well. All three weapons were very, very common on the battlefield in the late 14th, 15th centuries. All the way right through up until, in some formations and some armies, the Thirty Years' War. They were designed to enhance somebody's fighting power by utilising that person's potential energy in the form of their muscles, in the form of the chemicals that they've actually taken on board in the form of food that day. So it's chemical energy and potential energy, or being translated into potential energy, then being translated into kinetic energy. The whole point behind war, and always has been, is to actually provide your opponent with more energy than he can handle. Just ask the uh, denizens of Hiroshima. What we're going to do next is we're actually going to look at what happens on curved plate with padding behind it. The idea is to take everything literally step by step by step. And eventually, in the next week or so, we're going to be working on simulated skulls to see if we can actually recreate some of the wounds that we saw on Richard III. Especially the one to the top of the Calvarum, just there. Talk to you later. Have fun. I'm now going to go and muck out some horses. See you later.